Hello, welcome to Tala Talks NICU. I'm Dr. Tala, and today we are continuing our lectures on sepsis, very clinically relevant points of sepsis. So if you haven't seen part one, go back and watch that now. Number seven, and remember, we're continuing the numbering from part one. So number seven, what are the signs of sepsis? As you all know, the signs of sepsis can start very subtly. A neonate is never going to tell you, I'm not feeling well today. But instead, you have to pick up on their very, very subtle signs as they're just lying there. So maybe they are a lot more lethargic, so they're sleeping more. Maybe their bodies become floppier, so they become more hypertonic, like they're more kind of like a rag doll. Maybe they become a lot more irritable, so they're crying out a lot more. If the baby is orally feeding, then maybe the amount that they're taking by mouth drops down a lot. Or if they're gavage feeding, maybe they're no longer tolerating their feeds. Their belly gets distended, they start having more residuals, or they start vomiting. Sometimes the changes are even more subtle than this. Their skin color just kind of looks a little bit off. They look more greenish or grayish in color. And honestly, being able to recognize when the baby or patient is slightly off is a really big part of working in the NICU or, or with babies generally. And part of that is knowing your baby really well. Obviously, if you've taken care of the baby for the first week of its life, you're the primary nurse or you're the provider taking care of the baby, you have a much better baseline so that when the baby does something abnormal, you're much more likely to think, okay, that's weird. Same thing if the parents are by the bedside all the time and they're like, something's off with my baby today, that is such a huge red flag for me. If the mummy's always there and on day eight, she's like, I don't know, she's a lot sleepier or something today, that's probably enough for me to prompt me to do some sort of septic screen. Sometimes though, as you all know, the symptoms of sepsis can be a lot more objective. So maybe the baby's FiO2 goes up, they need a lot more respiratory support, or they start having a lot more apneas and bradycardias or more uh, periodic breathing. Maybe they've got a lot of temperature instability, whether they get a fever or they become hypothermic, or their belly gets distended, or they have pus coming out near a catheter, or their skin becomes red. Something that you could very categorically point at and be like, this is wrong. Often those objective signs can happen before those kind of more subjective signs. So just make sure that you're staying really attuned to what your baby is up to. Eight, so what do we do about it when we're concerned that a baby has sepsis? Well, obviously we're in medicine. The first thing that we do is get a really good physical exam. Now I'm going to cover kind of all the important physical exam findings you should definitely be going over if you're concerned that your baby may have sepsis. So A, first of all, you have to just get that overall gestalt of the baby. So just go look at the baby. Is the baby just sleeping there, floppy, not doing anything? Or is the baby active and fighting and looks pink and well perfused? So just that first instinct when you look at the baby is so important. B, Check the anterior fontanelle. Is it full and bulging? Are we worried about meningitis here or a bad IVH or something? Or is it kind of really sunken and the baby is now getting dehydrated? C, listen to the lungs. Do the lungs sound junkier? Are they like kind of more crackly? Is air not going in as well? If the baby is intubated, are there more secretions coming out of the endotracheal tube? D, Listen to the heart. Make sure you're not hearing any weird clicks or something that could maybe suggest endocarditis. But more commonly, if there is sepsis going on, then often that causes the ductus to open a bit and you're more likely to hear a murmur. So just do a good cardiac exam. E, listen to the belly. So put your stethoscope over the belly. Can you hear bowel sounds? Obviously, if you don't hear bowel sounds, you're worried about neck. And you're also worried about a septic ileus. An ileus is when the intestine just kind of stops moving because all around it, the body is sick. So for example, a bad UTI could cause a septic ileus where peristalsis stops and you can't hear bowel sounds any longer. While you're looking at the belly, is it reddened? Is it distended? Is it full? Is it hard? Are you really worried about neck? And F, and I think that we all don't do this well enough, check every single square centimeter of the baby's skin and scalp. So you could easily be missing like a pustule or a little infection somewhere. Places that we miss commonly are under the neck, under the axilla, in the groin area. 
make sure you roll the baby over and check the back really well. Also feel all the joints, especially the larger joints on the body. There could be some sort of bone or joint infection. Check around the umbilicus. Is there any drainage? Is it red or angry looking? Maybe the baby has an omphalitis, an infection of like the umbilical area. Also, and this almost goes without saying, but I'm gonna say it, check anywhere that there's a line in the baby, whether it's a pick line or an umbilical line, if there's an endotracheal tube, even all the different stickers on the baby, there's a higher chance that there's gonna be some sort of infection under the skin, under all the like the heart rate monitor or the temperature probe. So a really good physical exam is absolutely key whenever you're worried about sepsis. Number nine, what blood work or imaging do we do when we are worried about sepsis? Obviously, the number one most important thing is to get a good blood culture, preferably from a peripheral vein or peripheral artery, so a peripheral culture. And preferably, even though these babies are really small, we want to get a one milliliter sample. We assume very often when the baby is acting like the baby was sick and septic and somehow the blood culture doesn't grow out, that maybe there just wasn't enough blood to be able to grow out that bacteria. So whenever you're getting a blood culture, try really hard to get a full one milliliter into that sample. If the infant is older than 72 hours, and some people say a week, depending I guess on how small the baby is, then get a urine culture as well. And this should be done with a straight calf. So insert the catheter, get the urine, and then pull it out again. If you bag the urine, you're going to get a bunch of bacteria and you're not going to be able to interpret it. Then the rest of your cultures are going to depend on what you see. If the baby's respiratory support has gone up considerably and the baby's having loads of secretions from the trach, then maybe send a gram strain and a culture from the trach. If the baby has like a huge pustule somewhere, then maybe pop it and send gram stain and culture on the pus that was in the pustule. If the infant is having more nasal congestion or again, more respiratory support, then also consider sending a viral respiratory panel. So maybe the baby did pick up RSV or Corona or the flu or adenovirus, even though the baby is inside the unit. Maybe there are other concerning findings that you see. Maybe baby has a candidal rash on them, or you see postules that could be consistent with herpes. Then obviously here send herpes PCR or herpes cultures. Then if you do see any abnormal findings on your physical exam of the belly or the lungs, then you should probably be getting a KUB, which is an X-ray of the belly, as well as an X-ray of the lungs. Again, I'm going to emphasize this again though, that really you need to make sure before you start antibiotics that you are getting a blood culture. If you can, peripherally, and it should be at least one ml. Number 10. When do we perform a lumbar puncture or a spinal tap? Or when are we trying to get cerebrospinal fluid? Well, any time you have a positive blood culture, there is some very, very tiny exceptions, but generally, if you have a positive blood culture, you should be getting cerebrospinal fluid. You should be getting a spinal tap to make sure that that baby doesn't have meningitis because as we've already discussed, babies have a really weak blood-brain barrier. So positive blood culture, you need to do a spinal tap. When else do you tap? Well, a retrospective study showed that in about a third of the times they had a positive CSF culture, even though their blood culture was negative. So what does this mean? If you're only going to tap the babies with a positive blood culture, then you're gonna miss a whole bunch of meningitis. To be fair, this was a retrospective review of all these babies. So all those providers that decided to tap the baby, they had pretty good reasons for being worried enough about having meningitis to actually perform the cerebrospinal fluid obtainment even though the blood culture was negative. So what sort of reasons would make you actually want to perform a tap even with blood cultures being negative. So the first one is a fever. If a baby has a fever, then that could be a very concerning sign of meningitis. Remember, neonates, especially like preemie babies, don't have the typical adult or kid signs of meningitis. They don't have a stiff neck. They might not even have a bulging fontanelle. Maybe the babies were acting really, really sick and the blood work was staying really abnormal, the CBC or the inflammatory markers. And so everybody felt, okay, there's sepsis somewhere. We need to make sure that we're not missing it anywhere. So these are all reasons why you should still consider a tap, even though the blood culture may be negative. 
Basically, if you still have a really sick kid and you have no obvious source, then get an LP. 11. What about other indirect markers of infection? Well, as we're constantly reminded by our infectious disease or ID colleagues, those markers are really not very sensitive or very specific. So just as a reminder, sensitive means that you could actually have an infection, but like the CRP and the WBC and everything looks completely normal. So that means that it wasn't sensitive enough to pick up the infection. And not specific means that you could have a very elevated CRP or whatever else, but the baby doesn't have an infection. It's actually something else entirely that has caused the CRP to be elevated. So it's not specific for the infection. So the way that we improve the utility of these tests is not to use them in a vacuum. So for example, if there was a really, really sick looking kid and we got a CBC and the WBC count was 4,000, then for me, I would be very concerned about that kid having sepsis. Whereas if we're just getting routine Monday labs and we find out that the WBC count is 4,000, then you're obviously less concerned about that which by the way is a very good reason to not get routine labs if you're not going to do anything about it and you don't want to see these mild abnormalities that will then maybe force you to do more labs. I'll run through some of the numbers that have been shown to be slightly more sensitive but again take all of these with a pinch of salt. So leukopenia when you have a WBC count of less than 5,000 leukocytosis when you have a WBC count of more than 30,000, a low absolute neutrophil count, so a low ANC, which is less than 1,500, an elevated I over T ratio, so kind of above 0.2 or 0.3, and we made a video on all these numbers, so you can go back and look at that. Thrombocytopenia, so a platelet count of less than 150,000, and an elevated CRP. So CRP kind of comes in two different units depending on which hospitals that you work at. So get used to those units. So generally a number of above one mg per deciliter or above 10 mg per liter are concerning numbers. Again, CRP is super nonspecific. Honestly, I think that the most important thing when you're looking at abnormal labs is to compare them to the previous lab work that the babies had done, if, they, if they've had any done. So for example, if you had a baby who had platelets that were 30, 330, 340, 320, and then suddenly the platelets are 152,000, that's really concerning, even though they're kind of basically normal level platelets. Or if the white blood cell count has been hanging at 12, 13, 14,000, and suddenly you get a WBC count and it's 38,000, that again is concerning. This baby's under stress. Is that stress because of sepsis? So anytime you get an abnormal number, the first thing that you do, because you can do this very quickly, is go back and look at the previous level. And a huge change from the previous level may be enough, even if the number is quote unquote normal, like the 152,000, that's still normal platelets. But that might be enough to convince me with the clinical picture that we need to start antibiotics. Number 12, should we be sending routine endotracheal tube cultures? ET tube cultures, I can't say that word. Should we be sending routine cultures from the endotracheal tube? This is a really tricky one because, as you all know, if you have the endotracheal tube in long enough, which really isn't that long, probably hours, then eventually that endotracheal tube is going to get colonized. So it's going to have bacteria that are just hanging out on its surface. And a lot of people argue that if we send it, then we are going to find something and then what are we going to do with it? We can't treat every single baby because they're colonized in their endotracheal tube. But if a baby is having respiratory symptoms, so needs increased support, needs increased oxygen, and especially if the baby is having increased secretions, especially if the secretions have kind of really changed color, they become yellowish or greenish, then it can be helpful in those scenarios to send an endotracheal tube culture. In this case, you should be looking initially at the gram stain, and what you're looking on the gram stain is how many white blood cells there are. There should be many or numerous white blood cells, according to the pathologist, to actually call it a tracheitis or a pneumonia. If there are more epithelial cells than white blood cells, then that is not a good sample, and it's highly unlikely that the baby's fighting an infection. 
And then if the trait culture does end up growing out of bacteria, then you can get sensitivities on it. And at least you can narrow down your antibiotics to exactly what that bacteria is. And you could also make the argument that if the baby gets any future infection, then at least you kind of have an idea of what the baby's colonized with. And you know, with some future infection, you definitely want to cover for that bacteria that you found in the lungs. Okay, that's the end of part two. Again, I hope you learned something. If you want to, then please like this video and subscribe to this channel. And remember to go and watch part three after this, and then you'll know everything you need to know about sepsis. Kind of, kind of. Anyway, thank you so much for being here.